recovery of a Navy aircraft right. that had crashed in 1948. Yeah, it was a, a P-2V, so think of the P-3 variant back then. And uh, yeah, uh, Commander Holden, Tim Holden had been sent out, as you recall, this was during the kind of the tanker wars and been sent out to the Windbrown. So I was the acting CO uh, as the executive officer. And uh, George Bush, who had been, uh, I think, initially the vice president and then, of course, became president, had had uh, been petitioned by the families of the uh, the naval aviators that had been killed in this crash. The, the plane had never been found. And, uh, and they had been asking for uh, the Navy to put on kind of a full court press to try to find the aircraft. There had been some speculation where it went down. Um, and this had gone on for years. Eventually, somebody found the remains, but because it was in such kind of a treacherous condition, they, they couldn't, or found the, the, what they thought was the remains of the airplane, but couldn't, couldn't get to it. So eventually, uh, we get the letter, you know, the, the president uh, wants us to, to go recover the aircraft because it's at about 10,000 feet. That's where they thought it was. Uh, and they figured we could do some high altitude diving. Uh, so as the executive officer, I get tagged to be the kind of mission commander. And it was a, uh, a unique experience. I, I took uh, a guy named George Parkhill, who was, uh, I think George was probably a chief or senior chief at the time. He uh, ran the dive locker when I got the SEAL Team 1. Yeah, he was the, the dive <laughs> master, and that's why I picked George and a couple of other great guys uh, to go up there. And so we get up to this place called First Tofino, and then uh, we have to take Hilo out to the uh, kind of the middle of nowhere on the outback. And the place where we think the plane has crashed is in what I believe to have been kind of an old volcanic, uh, uh, you know, uh, area. I mean, it, it looks like the inside of a, what you think of as a volcano, almost like Diamond Head. Um, and there's a lake in the middle of it. Uh, where the snow is melted off and the, you could only get into this place like for a month out of the year because it would it would freeze over and so this was I think September time frame so we get on the ground and there's I mean you, you, the helo can't even land so we had to kind of jump off the helo and kind of get set up um, but uh, we're, we're looking around and there's clearly no airplane in this uh, in this bowl we're in but there is uh, off to the area where the sun doesn't hit so the sun would kind of make its way around but never kind of quite got to this area and as you look, there's this kind of, the only thing I can think of to describe it is like a snow tunnel. Uh, and it goes up about a thousand plus feet. And it is, you know, I mean, it's just a, a, a an area that's just completely covered with ice. And, uh, but we're looking around thinking that the plane is probably in the water. That's what we're, why we were sent up to get it. Well, the next day after we get in there, uh, Park Hill goes over and uh, and starts chipping into this uh, this kind of ice cave and goes in and I'll be damned, the, there the plane is. It's, it is hidden under this ice cave and has been there for you know, 40, 50 years at that point in time. Of course it is because the ice would melt and it would just crush the plane. So there's nothing left but you know, tiny pieces. Although actually the 50 cows survived. Um, but so now we have found the remains of the plane. And, uh, and again, there were some, uh, we eventually bring uh, some of the family out that was fit enough to, to be there. Uh, we, we did manage to find some bone fragments, and we buried those at the site. But in the, in the book, I, I, I tell the story, and, uh, and I said, uh, you can believe it or not, but uh, it is true, and I'm not the only one to have seen it. As we are kind of burying the, uh, the remains of this thing, and we, I say a little prayer over this, uh, this cross we put up there, and uh, as I get through saying it, all of a sudden one of the guys turns to me and goes, hey, sir, take a look up there. And again, if you can imagine, we're in this bowl, and I think it goes up to about 8,000 feet or something like that. And, uh, and right above the ridge line, I see what looks like a parachute flare. I'm thinking, is somebody shooting parachute flares? Uh, you know, and I'm looking around thinking, well, maybe one of our guys is, you know, shooting parachute flares. And I, um, nobody's shooting parachute flares. There's one, and there's two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and, and they're kind of hovering up there and looking around thinking, what in the world? And the guy says, uh, hey, sir, how many of those do you see? And again, it's, it's this kind of glowing orb, and it's just kind of floating up there, and there were nine of them, and there were nine victims on the plane. And, uh, and it was up there for 10 or 15 minutes. They all kind of hovered up, and then one by one, they just kind of went up. So I said, look, uh, you can believe the story or not, but uh, I'm not the only one that saw it. And I've often thought, well, if somebody was firing parachute flares, please let me know, because it was kind of one of those surreal moments, because uh, you are out in the outback where there is nothing out there. Um, but, uh, but interestingly enough, uh, another kind of story like the, like the Barney Brown story in that 
um, I get a call from uh, you know a good uh, good friend who you would know, Jeremy Williams, and uh, JW says, "Hey, sir, um, got an army buddy. Uh, I, we were just having dinner, and I was telling him about your book, and uh, I, I, he's going to call you when he gets to San Francisco." I said, "Okay." So he was flying back to Hawaii, and I get a call from this guy. He says, "Hey, sir, uh, JW was telling me about your story in your book, and so I got a copy of it." That was my grandfather mm. that, uh, that died on that crash. And, oh, by the way, my grandmother is still alive. So I got a hold of the grandmother, and uh, it was just a, a great conversation, wonderful lady. Um, and and, you re- and I, I told her, I said, ma'am, I, I don't want to tell you. The, the story I'm telling you in the book is exactly true. Um, you know, my, my hope is, uh, you know, uh, that your husband is in the right place. And, uh, and, this, and, and her husband had been... Uh, a young petty officer in the Navy during World War II, gets out of the Navy after World War II, and then missed the Navy so much, comes back in, gets assigned up to Whidbey Island as a... (laughs) 